perspective, the goal is to fly on a planet that has just 1% the atmosphere of Earth, and you're controlling that flight from over 100 million miles away. How difficult is that? Very, very difficult <laughs> to fly a rotorcraft at Mars. You know, a rotorcraft pushes the atmosphere to generate lift, and when there is that little atmosphere, the rotor system has to spin really fast. In fact, I will be spinning over 2,500 revolutions per minute for this flight today, and Ingenuity uh, is less than 1.8 kilograms, right? Four pounds. And in that four pounds, Ingenuity has to be able to fly in that very thin atmosphere and be able to survive and operate autonomously at Mars. For example, Ingenuity, our little four-pounder, has been on the surface of Mars, keeping itself warm throughout the cold nights, down to minus 130 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's been doing that every day. So on top of that, our flight experiment at Mars, we are operating it all the way back here from Earth. So yes, yeah, very challenging, but we're ready. Oh, Ingenuity is small, but it is mighty, and the team has come so far already. What other milestones has the helicopter team already achieved before this morning? Ingenuity has passed all of its milestones leading up to the first flight. So performed perfectly during cruise, survived the drop, and has been charging itself with high good energy levels each time. It's been communicating daily to the base station and keeping itself warm. And all, with the rotor system all checked out to full speed, Ingenuity is ready to go. And at the high level for the Mars Helicopter Technology Project, uh, we have three goals that are in line with NASA's agency level objectives. The first is to demonstrate here on Earth that it is possible to fly a controlled power flight in the thin atmosphere of Mars. We've done that. The second objective is to perform that actual flight at Mars. Well, we're about to get data back very soon here on that first flight. And the third is to return data to inform engineers uh, working on designing future generations of Mars helicopter. We have received valuable information data back since we have dropped on the surface. And tonight's uh, data from the first uh, flight will be extremely important. So we're ready to go. We are ready to go. Now, what is success going to look like for you guys tonight? So there are five scenarios, okay? So if the solution we implemented successfully transitions the helicopter to the flight mode, we'll be all right. But if it doesn't transition, uh, then we will be attempting the flight again tomorrow. If we don't get to flight mode tonight, then we'll go on. Uh, when we, if we go successfully to the flight mode, there are four scenarios. Full success in flight. Second scenario could be partial success in flight. The third would be not having sufficient information, in which case we'll need more time to determine what happened. The fourth could be failure. So whatever the outcome, we are set here to learn. And a bright future is ahead, Mimi. The risk is huge, but the reward is high. We will all be rooting for your team. Good luck. Thank you, Marina. As we get closer to the data arrival, let's talk to Tim Canham, Ingenuity Operations Lead. Thanks for joining us, Tim. Thanks, Marina. Glad to be here. Now, how does the data even get here from the helicopter to the team? Well, as they say, sometimes it's complicated, right? So the helicopter does not have a radio that can talk directly to Earth, so we need the help of the rover. As a matter of fact, the rover has an instrument on board, which is also built by the helicopter team called the Helicopter Base Station. The Helicopter Base Station has a radio which talks to the helicopter. So as you have, have heard, earlier today, the helicopter flew as it was flying, and after it landed, it transferred its data to the base station. And then the rover takes the data from the base station and transmits it to an orbiter. That would be the MRO orbiter. And then the MRO orbiter turns to Earth and then sends all the data to the Deep Space Network. At that point, the Deep Space Network itself turns around, sends it to JPL and into the ground data systems. At that point, when it shows up, our team can take that data and decode it and see what happened during the flight. It sounds like it has to be well choreographed, Tim. How do you plan the first flight? It's a remote autonomous operation. What goes into the planning and the execution? Well, you know, we've done it all as a team, as we have all along. It's, it's been a challenge with COVID to be remote, but we learned new ways to, to, to work together. 
Uh, we're a small team, but we're a fast moving team. We practiced all of these things over the course of the last year, from getting the data from the rover to decoding it, to interpreting what it meant. And <clears throat> as we got to Mars, when the rover landed us safely, we were able to start our survey for right field and we found it fortunately right near where we landed. And so working with other instruments on the rover like Meta with the weather instrument and ZCAM, which is this beautiful camera to take pictures, we planned our flight. The flight will be about 40 seconds long. We'll lift off, we'll pivot towards the rover, and then we'll land. It's gonna be a very basic flight, just to we wanna do the very uh, basic things first to make sure that we can do our flight. And then at that point, we will get all our data back and look at it, but we had to practice all those things. And we've been using this time on the surface to get familiar with the vehicle and how it operates and work around those various troubles that Mimi talked about, and the team is ready to go. And Tim, what specifically will the helicopter team be looking for as we go through this morning? So one of the great things about this helicopter is it has a very powerful processor. It's tiny, but it's powerful, and we get lots and lots of data the processor itself is about 100 times as powerful as the processor, even on the rover. And so we get all this data, as I mentioned, that gets sent to the rover, and then the rover sends it to us. So as our downlink lead, Michael Starch, sees that data arrive in the data center, he will decode it and look for it. He will look for the successful arrival of the data. At that point, we turn the data over to Hobart Grip, our chief pilot, and he will look at the portion of the data that relates to how the flight went. There are a series of events that the helicopter sends as it transitions through each stage of the flight. And when Hobart is able to verify that the progression went as planned, then he'll turn to the actual data and look at a plot of the altimeter, which is one of the instruments used in navigation. We should see the plot of the altimeter go up to the, to the flight height and then come back down again. And that will be a positive confirmation that we got it. And finally, from the helicopter side, we are snapping a series of black and white downward facing pictures as the helicopter commences for landing. So if everything goes well, we should see some of those landing pictures and be able to look at them on the screen. So Hobart will display those as well. And then finally, if all goes well, there should be at the same time our data is coming down, there should be data coming down from the ZCAM instrument that I mentioned, the MassCam Z, a really powerful camera system that's gonna try and capture us in flight. So if they, were the, if they were able to capture that moment of flight, then they will be able to display those images on their screen and be able to see a quick view of how the helicopter flew. That's how it's gonna go. Well, Tim, we can't wait to see those photos for sure. Thank you so much and good luck to you. Thank you. We will get back to the action in the room in just a moment. Now joining us is Associate Administrator of NASA's Science Mission Directorate, Thomas Zerbukin, who is here at JPL for the helicopter's first test flight. Welcome, Thomas. I'm so glad to be here, Marina. Hi. Hi. Now, how important is tonight to space exploration? Oh, it's techno technology demonstrations are really important for all of us. You know, it's really taking a tool that we haven't been able to use and put it in the box of tools that is available for all of our missions going forward at Mars. So for me, it's really exciting personally and for the community overall, it opens up new doors. And Thomas, why is it important to have that aerial dimension to space exploration? There's many applications that require that. Imagine, for example, going into areas of, you know, and exploring them that we cannot use a rover for them. Some of these creative walls that are so exciting, scientists have been writing papers about it. It's also important to have the aerial dimension in the context of human exploration of Mars, of, of which we're dreaming even now, and that aerial dimension being kind of able to scout the head is just absolutely critical. Well, thank you so much for join, joining us, Dr. Z. Hey, thanks. Let's check back in now with Taryn Bailey to see how things are shaping up with the team's next steps. Hey, Taryn. Hey, Marina. We're moments away from receiving that all-important data, and the anticipation is definitely building in the room. Everyone's very focused, just waiting on pins and needles, eagerly waiting for that data to arrive, and we're just preparing ourselves for what comes down. And, you know, this was such a big challenge for us to embark upon as a team, and we are such a small and close-knit team. 
So it was really, it's really great to be back in the room with all of my colleagues and my teammates. Uh, we're all here in support of one another. We have Bob Dalrym watching, and he's been the vision behind this so from the very beginning. So we have such great leadership on this team, and um, very excited to be here. <laughs> And we're going to be hearing from a lot of people, Taryn. So can you let us know who we're going to be hearing from as we progress through the morning? Yes, yeah, so we'll first hear from our downlink lead, Michael Starch. And he's going to be the person that first lays eyes on the data. And when he receives it, he'll unpack it. He'll run through a data receivable procedure, um, make his call outs, and then he'll hand it over to our guidance navigation and control lead, also our chief pilot, Havard Grip. Um, he'll interpret that data and display an altimeter plot to indicate if we flew. Some other voices we'll hear on VOCA <laughs> will be um, our deputy ops lead, Teddy Zenitos, who will report on the battery status, and our systems engineer, Yako Karras, who will report on the motor health. And we're going to be taking a couple of your social media questions right now as we wait for Michael to make that announcement that the data is coming in. So, Taryn, a man named Flo on Instagram asks, why did we send a helicopter to Mars in the first place? Great question. Why not? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, Sending a, an aerial vehicle uh, at this stage especially, um, you know, we have sent five rovers uh, to Mars and now we have an aerial dimension which uh, Dr. Zerbukin pointed out that it's really important because it elevates the next stage of space exploration. And we can do more science with it. It can be a coordinated effort for future missions. It also opens the doorway for human exploration. And the helicopter can go into areas where the rover can't. So there are a lot of um, caves, and, and the rover has to overcome a lot of obstacles on the ground that the helicopter can ideally move around. And that's why it's such a great option for uh, putting an aerial vehicle on another planet. And as Tim mentioned, it has to be well choreographed, this flight. And so Elio on Instagram asks, why is the first flight only vertical? So every flight, we're going to build upon it. But this first flight, our mission success criteria is really to demonstrate that we can fly. And so that's why this first flight is really all about being able to demonstrate that we can fly on another planet. And so that means we'll do... Um, a three meter hover above the Martian surface, touch back down to signal success, and then we can um, advance from there. And getting back to what everyone's going to be looking at, you had mentioned that Hovard is going to be looking at a plot. What exactly is that going to look like? Is it easy to see if the flight actually took place? Yes, yeah, so his altimeter plot will indicate a peak, and um, we'll start off with a flat line indicating that we were grounded. Then we'll spin up and it'll have a steep incline to show that we've <laughs> risen. And then at the top, we'll have a dwell where we're hovering and then another uh, steep decline in the graph to show that we've touched down. So it should be pretty cut and dry to see that we have successfully flew. And this morning, of course, as you mentioned, the helicopter flew a few hours ago, and we're waiting to see if it did happen. But you did a whole lot of testing here on Earth before you sent Ingenuity up there. Tell me what it was like to test the helicopter and simulate that Mars environment. Absolutely. So it went just, just because the helicopter is the first of its kind, the testing also is very similar in that way. We had to simulate a Mars-like atmosphere by using very large thermal vacuum chambers to allow us to control the temperature and pressure so we can simulate a Mars-like atmospheric density. Then we also created a gravity offload system that compensates for the difference in gravity between Earth and Mars. Um, in addition to that, we validated a lot of our requirements with engineering models. So these are developmental models that we made. and. Um, they went through extensive environmental and aerodynamic testing. And so they were the precursors to our flight vehicle, which is, of course, currently on Mars. And as Mimi mentioned before, it had to be super light and super fast. Why is that? Oh, flying on Mars is very difficult. You guys have heard it before. It's less than 1% of Earth's atmosphere, and that means that we have to have something really lightweight for us to 
overcome that mass to generate enough lift. And, you know, kudos and thank you very much to our friends over at Air Environment who designed and built this custom rotor system that is super lightweight. Each blade is less than two ounces made of composite material for that very reason. And it spans the distance. The wingspan of this helicopter is four feet tip to tip. So that's about, that's 1.2 meters. <laughs> that's super large for something that's essentially carrying the size of a tissue box, <laughs> just to give you a frame of reference. And in addition to that, generating enough lift involves having high RPM. So we're flying at, an, on an average of 2,500 RPM. 2,500. RPM. I just want everyone to sit with that for a minute because here on Earth, helicopters go 400 to 500 RPM. So that is so much faster, Taryn. It's incredibly fast, incredibly fast. Every detail on this vehicle has, is made and designed for it to be the most efficient. We are beginning to see data products. We will continue to watch data products as the full set comes in. All right, Taryn. Well, we just heard from Michael that they are taking a look at the data just starting to flow into the deep space network antenna on Earth. What happens now that the rover has started sending that data? Yes, so for those of you at home, the deep space network is our giant communications network. That this is downlink, early indications, data products look nominal. Excellent. We'll continue to wait for the full data set to arrive. In the meantime, I'll explain a little bit about the Deep Space Network and that it's our main communications tool to um, communicate, talk to our Ingenuity helicopter from across our solar system. So our downlink lead just announced that data products had just started to arrive and that they look nominal, which is a good indication. Um, while we wait for the full data set to arrive, um, we'll We'll wait. <laughs> I guess that's what we'll do. We'll wait in the meantime. <laughs> and we'll answer another social media question along those lines. Jose on YouTube asks, how long does it take for the video signal from the helicopter to reach Earth? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Yes. <laughs> how long does it take for the video signal from the helicopter to reach Earth? Yeah, so that goes into having that very long distance between Earth and us. So uh, Tim touched on this a little earlier, and that's why we have this delay. So the helicopter flew earlier, and similarly, whenever we send data, it's the same process where there's going to be a delay of when, it, when, we, when we run the data and then when it hits Earth. So it's about um, four hours from when something is executed to when we receive it. For larger files, though, sometimes that can take longer. So it all depends. But today we'll be receiving uh, images, still images, of the helicopter. And I know we are eagerly anticipating those images. And we talked a little bit about this before, Taryn. Uh, we have been just floored by all the great images coming in from Perseverance. But Ingenuity has cameras as well. Absolutely. The helicopter is equipped with two cameras. Uh, one is our onboard navigation camera, and that's the image that we'll receive tonight. And that's going to be a black and white image that's pointed straight down at the Martian surface, and will hopefully be showing us hovering above it. Uh, our second camera is our return to Earth camera, and that's our higher resolution camera that is a color photo and shows more of the Martian horizon uh, snapshot, the beauty shot, if you will. And then, um, and that, that image will be utilized for future um, flight missions. And we have another great social media question here from Hing on Facebook asking, what is the biggest question this first flight will answer about aerodynamics on Mars? Well, the biggest question that we had to answer when embarking on this was, can we lift? Can we generate enough lift and fly in a Martian atmosphere? And I think this first flight will indicate that for sure and will answer that question. And um, whatever we receive back will definitely give us more information moving forward, uh, regardless of this first flight uh, or, or potential other outcomes. And we've got another question on social. 
Waki on Twitter asks, happy flight day. Why are the blades shaped the way they are? That's a really great question. So for, uh, in order to generate enough lift, uh, each blade, I mentioned that these were a custom design, and what we call them are airfoils. And they're developed in a way so that it generates enough lift for us to fly and have enough thrust underneath of um, our helicopter vehicle. So uh, they have that funky shape because of the aerodynamic um, elements that help it generate enough lift. And once again, reminding everybody that you guys are controlling this from over 100 million miles away here on Earth. I always try to wrap my head around that. <laughs> Absolutely. It is so far away and uh, it's, it's miraculous to even think that this is something that's technically already been executed earlier today. We're just kind of standing by and waiting for that data to arrive to indicate, you know, success. Well, we are going to have minimal commentary during this time as we're going to let you enjoy this experience with the team as they go through all the data to see how Ingenuity did. So let's head to the helicopter control room. This is downlink. Data products appear to be in. We will begin processing shortly. This is downlink. We are beginning to fetch data from Mars 2020. This is Downlink. We have pulled in data products from Mars 2020. This is downlink, confirming we received Mars 2020 telemetry, confirming that we received Mars 2020 events, confirming that we received helicopter data products, confirming that we have data products, confirming that we unpacked image and one hertz data.
This is Downlink. We have successfully ingested one hertz data. Confirming that we have helicopter data products, helicopter telemetry, helicopter events. Confirming helicopter file listing. Confirming expected boot counts. This is downlink confirming battery uh, data has been received. Rotor motors appear healthy. Swashplate servos appear healthy. Overall actuators appear healthy. Confirming thermal report generation. Confirming analog report generation. Confirming telecom report generation. This is downlink handing off to flight control for telemetry analysis. This flight control confirming that we have EVRs from Ingenuity. Ingenuity is reporting having performed spin up, takeoff, climb, hover, descent, landing, touchdown and spin down. And al altimeter data confirms that Ingenuity has performed its first flight, the first flight of a powered aircraft on another planet. Martian surface. Taryn, go ahead and repeat that. 
So the image we're looking at on the screen is the image from our onboard navigation camera showing us hovering above the surface of Mars. How incredible! <laughs> and that's its shadow, right, Taryn? Yes, that's its shadow. So the onboard navigation camera points straight down, so we're seeing its shadow right now. I can just hear Mimi in the background. This is real! This is real! It's so amazing. <laughs> yeah, everyone's really really feeling it now. So we're, uh, we're going to wait for the Perseverance rover image of us. what we just saw with the Perseverance image. So the Persever Perseverance image is showing us um, grounded at first. It's, it's actually a video, which is great. It's grounded at first and then shows us hovering our three meters above the Martian surface and then touching back down. It's amazing, brilliant. Everyone is, is super excited. <laughs> so I would say it's a success. I would say
Congratulations to the Ingenuity helicopter team on making history this morning. To get the latest updates on Ingenuity, follow on at NASA JPL on Facebook and Twitter. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us at this early morning hour. The journey on this month of Ingenuity continues. Join us for a news briefing later this morning at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time for a deeper analysis of Ingenuity's first flight and what what this means for NASA. I'm Marina Jurica. Thanks for watching and good night and go ingenuity. Three thousand orbits of the Earth, a mission of 78.4 million miles. We are just uh, less than 31 minutes away from the engine firing of four minutes and 39 seconds now, that will slow the Soyuz down by 128 meters per second to enable the Soyuz to drop out of orbit to begin its entry back into the Earth's atmosphere, and a landing just one hour and 24 minutes from now on the steppe of Kazakhstan, 91 miles to the southeast of the town of Jezkazgan, where Russian search and recovery forces will be awaiting the arrival of these three crew members who have spent uh, half a year in space. Everything is in great shape aboard the uh, Soyuz spacecraft. All the systems are uh, checked out, ready to go. Just a short time ago, just a few minutes ago, the director of the Cosmonaut uh, Training Center in Star City, Russia, Pavel Vlasov, who directs the Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center, radioed up to the crew that uh, conditions at the landing site are calm and peaceful. He described the air as fresh with low humidity and said the landing site has the smell of spring. It smells like freshly cut grass. Have a good flight home to your home planet. Those words coming from Pavel Vlasov, the director of the Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center. And we are at the airport in uh, Jezkazgan, uh, the forward uh, staging site for tonight's landing and recovery operations, a dozen Mi-8 helicopters are uh, set to take off a short time from now, uh, most of them heading uh, for the prime landing site to, to the southeast of Jezkazgan. Two of the helicopters to move uh, to the midpoint between uh, the landing site and the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan in the event uh, of a ballistic landing, the unlikely event of a shortfall in the uh, trajectory of the Soyuz back to Earth. And uh, two additional helicopters uh, will be poised uh, in the vicinity, uh, all uh, of the bases covered, to recover the crew as quickly as possible following their touchdown in their Soyuz MS-17 spacecraft. The three returning crew members, Kate Rubens of NASA, Sergey. Uh, Rizhikov, who's the Soyuz MS-17 commander and who was also the Expedition 64 commander during uh, this long-duration uh, mission aboard the International Space Station, and flight engineer Sergei Kud Sverchkov are uh, in the home stretch of their flight. Uh, Rubens, uh, when she lands, will have uh, logged 300 days in space on her two flights, the fourth most days in space by a U.S. female astronaut behind Peggy Whitson, Christina Cook, and Sonny Williams. 
Sergei Ryzhikov will have logged 185 days in space on his two missions uh, over this increment, Expeditions 63-64, and will have totaled 358 days in space on his two flights. Could Sverchkov is wrapping up his first flight into space. Some five hours ago aboard the International Space Station, the three departing crew members uh, had an opportunity one final time to say goodbye to the uh, crew members who are remaining on board the station, now part of Expedition 65, that officially began with the undocking of the Soyuz uh, from the International Outpost. They had a chance uh, to say farewell to one another and then make their way into the uh, Soyuz spacecraft where they subsequently closed the hatches. Uh, those hatches uh, swung closed at 5.24 p.m. Central Time, 6.24 p.m. Eastern Time, after which the uh, three departing crew members uh, began a series of leak checks on their side of the docking interface, as did the station crew on their side in the Poisk module of the International Space Station. The uh, three uh, Expedition 64 crew members who are coming back to Earth this evening, Kate Rubens, Sergei Ryzhikov, and Sergei Kudzverchkov, then donned their Russian Sokol launch and entry suits, conducted leak checks on those suits, closed uh, the hatches uh, to the uppermost portion of uh, the uh, Soyuz spacecraft, the orbital module section, and uh, configured uh, all of their systems, conducted communications checks, and everything is in great shape. Uh, for tonight's landing. At uh, 8.34 p.m. Central Time, 9.34 p.m. Eastern Time, as uh, the International Space Station flew over the Mongolian Chinese border, uh, hooks were opened uh, between the Soyuz and the Poisk module. Springs on both sides of the docking interface pushed off against one another, and the Soyuz was free backing away from uh, the docking port to which it had relocated just a month ago to free up the Rosviet module on the Earth-facing side of the Russian segment of the station for the arrival last week of three new crew members who uh, made their way to the space station, that uh, being Oleg Novitsky, uh, Pyotr Dubrov, and uh, NASA's Mark Vandehei. The uh, Soyuz uh, slowly backed away there were two firings of uh, Soyuz thrusters and a pair of separation burns to maintain an opening rate and increase that opening rate uh, from uh, the International Space Station. The Soyuz has now moved uh, to a position some uh, 32 kilometers away from the International Space Station in preparation for the deorbit burn that will be coming up less than 25 minutes from now. Twenty-five minutes of thrust deactivation, attitude is nominal, and the angle is currently 185.5. The deorbit burn is scheduled at 11.01 uh, p.m. Central Time. It, again, will be a four-minute, 39-second uh, retrograde firing, a braking maneuver of the Soyuz engines to slow the vehicle down by 128 meters per second, allowing it to drop out of orbit. Some 28 minutes after the deorbit burn, pyrotechnics will uh, fire to separate the three sections of the Soyuz. The three crew members on the center section or descent module will feel uh, the G-forces building up around them as they move through the plasma regime of the Earth's atmosphere. Once they exit the plasma uh, regime, uh, the command will be given to open up the parachutes 15 minutes before touchdown. First a drogue chute followed by a giant main chute and uh, the Soyuz will be canted into the correct position for its altimeter to measure its rate of descent and its altitude uh, from the landing site. Just a few seconds before touchdown, soft landing engines will fire, and the Soyuz will be home with landing scheduled at 11.56 p.m. Central Time, 10.56 a.m. Kazakhstan Time on Saturday morning. At the, the landing site, uh, just a few clouds uh, are uh, noticed uh, at about the 25,000-foot level. Visibility in excess of six miles. The temperature at landing time 
is expected to be about 64 degrees Fahrenheit, an ideal Saturday spring morning for the homecoming of Rubens, Rizhikov, and Kud Sverchkov. Again, uh, the Russian search and recovery forces are uh, ready to go from the Jezkazgan airport. Uh, the uh, various uh, recovery team members that includes embedded NASA personnel are already on their respective helicopters. Uh, at the time of the deorbit burn, rotors will be spinning and the helicopters will set off for about a 35-minute helicopter ride from Jezkazgan to the landing zone, some 91 miles to the southeast. They will arrive in a sequential fashion, will uh, begin to circle uh, in a racetrack fashion around the landing zone, waiting uh, for the arrival of the Soyuz under its chutes. After touchdown, those helicopters will land uh, very quickly uh, in a sequential fashion again. Uh, the first of the helicopters uh, will be down to erect an inflatable orange medical tent near the capsule to which uh, the three crew members will be carried in their chairs uh, once they are extracted from the Soyuz and have a chance uh, to sit in those chairs for a few minutes to get their land legs back. Again, they'll be carried in those chairs into the medical tent where they'll uh, be helped out of their Sokol launch and entry suits. They'll get into more comfortable clothing. They'll undergo a series of medical tests before boarding three helicopters, one for each crew member, for a two-hour, 15-minute flight back uh, to uh, Karaganda, Kazakhstan, uh, which uh, was the initial staging city for tonight's landing operations. In Karaganda is a NASA jet and a Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center aircraft. Those uh, two aircraft uh, will be waiting for the arrival of the crew members who will split up at that point with Kate Rubens boarding the NASA jet for a flight back to Houston and uh, the two cosmonauts boarding their aircraft for a flight back to their training base in Star City, Russia, outside of Moscow. Two uh, milestones uh, following the deorbit burn, and uh, you will be hearing uh, uh, Soyuz Commander Sergei Rizhikov uh, through an interpreter calling out uh, the duration of the burn and uh, tank pressures uh, and the uh, delta V or the change in velocity as uh, the burn continues for the duration of its four minutes and 39 seconds. Once the burn is completed, the uppermost uh, section of the three-section Soyuz spacecraft, the orbital module, will be depressurized about 10 seconds after the completion of the burn. That will set the stage for its uh, pyrotechnic separation from the rest of the Soyuz uh, vehicle uh, once uh, we have completed the burn about 28 minutes after the deorbit burn prior to the entrance of the descent module with the three crew members back into the Earth's atmosphere. Once the Soyuz has moved to a distance of about 120 kilometers away from the International Space Station, we are expecting uh, VHF voice communications to become ratty and perhaps unavailable uh, because of the distance involved in the geometry between the antennas on the Soyuz spacecraft and the International Space Station. Uh, it will uh, be, uh, sometimes we uh, get lucky and the communications hang in there, sometimes not so much. So we'll see what happens this evening. But once the Soyuz uh, moves toward the vicinity of the landing site, there is a, a Russian Antonov uh, 26 uh, space, uh, fixed wing aircraft that operates as a uh, flying command and control center through which uh, voice and data will be relayed back to uh, Russian flight controllers at the Russian Mission Control Center outside of Moscow. So we'll be standing by to see whether or not uh, we hang in there with communications all the way down or lose communications. Don't be surprised if we go uh, with a loss of signal for a period of time and then reacquire communications with the Soyuz as it approaches the landing site.
As we mentioned uh, in our earlier broadcast tonight, uh, this is an unprecedented period of human spaceflight activity uh, at the International Space Station with uh, 14 astronauts and cosmonauts coming and going from the outpost in four different spacecraft over a three-week period. This uh, landing tonight uh, is the second of a four-act series that will continue next week at the Kennedy Space Center with the scheduled launch next Thursday on a SpaceX Dragon vehicle, the Endeavor of uh, Shane Kimbrough, Megan MacArthur, Aki Hoshide and Toma Pesquet as uh, that multinational crew launches from launch pad 39A at the Cape uh, to uh, rendezvous and dock uh, to the International Space Station to expand uh, the station's population from its current uh, seven-person crew to an 11-person crew for a period of time, a short period of time, until uh, the crew won astronauts who launched back in November, Mike Hopkins, Victor Glover, Soichi Noguchi, and um, Shannon Walker, who's the current commander of the International Space Station, until they return, their, their scheduled undocking and splashdown is scheduled for April 28th. So a busy time at the International Space Station. Air traffic control uh, definitely uh, is uh, the uh, prevailing uh, activity uh, for uh, not only the uh, station uh, astronauts and cosmonauts, but for uh, program officials and the international partnership as they make their way methodically step by step to ensure the uh, safe launch and landing and return to Earth of all of these crew members in the uh, continuing permanent human occupancy of the international laboratory. give you a sense of uh, all of the vehicles uh, currently at the International Space Station, you can see in this graphic uh, the current uh, configuration, the Soyuz MS-17, of course, uh, undocked a few hours ago, so it's gone, uh, ready for its deorbit burn to begin the uh, trip back to Earth. The Soyuz MS-18 that carried uh, Mark Vandehei, Oleg Novitsky, and Pyotr Dubrov to the station a week ago is uh, docked to the Earth-facing side of the Russian segment of the International Space Station. Also present, uh, the Crew-1 Dragon spacecraft at the uh, Zenith, or space-facing port of the Harmony module, soon to be joined by a second Crew Dragon, the Crew-2 the crew Dragon, that will dock to the forward port of Harmony. And you see two uh, unpiloted uh, Russian Progress cargo ships and the Northrop Grumman Cygnus cargo ship also present at the International Space Station. And confirm. We're now 14 and a half minutes away from the start of the deorbit burn. Again, a four minute, 39 second firing of the Soyuz engines to uh, slow it down by 128 meters per second, enabling it to drop out of orbit to begin its high speed return back to Earth.
The uh, Russian Search and Recovery Forces uh, that belong to the uh, Russian civilian agency called Rosaviatsa are all at the uh, Jez Kazgan Airport. Uh, those personnel all aboard uh, Russian MI-8 military helicopters with uh, rotors about to spin up. The first of those helicopters uh, to depart the airport for the landing site at about the time of the deorbit burn some 12 and a half minutes from now. Amongst uh, the NASA contingent uh, participating uh, in Kazakhstan uh, tonight uh, for tonight's landing and recovery operations include uh, Trisha Mack, who's the uh, Director of Human Spaceflight Programs in Russia, Bill Spetch uh, from the International Space Station Program Office, uh, representing uh, mission integration and operations for tonight's recovery operations, uh, Dr. Natasha Cho, who is uh, Kate Rubin's flight surgeon, a series of uh, Russian nurses attending to the three crew members with their own respective uh, flight surgeons as well. NASA Public Affairs Officer Courtney Beasley uh, will be uh, on one of the first helicopters down to the landing site, along with Bill Ingalls, NASA's chief photographer. Astronaut Drew Morgan is uh, representing the astronaut office uh, for tonight's recovery operations a veteran of a long duration mission aboard the International Space Station that launched on the 50th anniversary of uh, America's landing on the moon on Apollo 11. Coming up on the 10-minute mark before the deorbit burn, everything quiet aboard the uh, Soyuz vehicle. The uh, Soyuz commander, Sergei Ryzhikov, seated in the center seat of the uh, descent module, the centermost section of the three-section Soyuz spacecraft, flanked on his left by Sergei Kud Sverchkov and Kate Rubens on his right. And uh, there's uh, a cutaway view of the uh, descent module. Again, uh, the crew strapped in, having checked out uh, their spacesuits. Uh, they are clad in their Sokol launch and entry suits. Soon uh, to feel the first effects of Earth's gravity for the first time in more than six months. But the power has been shut off to the sensor. Is that right? One minute has passed, but the flag is still there, and we have, um, we did send the command, though, for the deactivation, um, and so uh, power supply to uh, the EKV is um, not being supplied, but you still have the, you don't have the flag. Is that right? Yes. And we confirm depot thrusters are firing and we have like 20 minutes left. Copy.
We can affirm the maneuver to Escade. Escade is minus eight minutes. And on the in the right info, we are sending the command. And D9, Delta 9, is illuminated. S Sierra 9 is illuminated. Copy, Sierra 9 is illuminated. Unintelligible. We copy. Countdown clocks uh, now hit the seven-minute mark prior to the deorbit burn. Four minutes and 39-second engine firing to slow uh, the Soyuz down and enable it to drop out of orbit to begin its trip back to Earth.